Welcome everyone to this session on uh, peace and conflict. Um, we uh, uh, are running alongside a series of uh, other parallel sessions. Uh, so I uh, will give a slow introduction so that we allow people to join in. Um, in these sessions, uh, as you've seen in the program, we have 45 minutes and we have three presentations. It does look like there's five speakers, but they're joint, uh, they're co-authors. Um, and we, uh, the presentations are, are going to be uh, uh, around the relationship between pandemics and violent conflict. So we'll have uh, all presentations are pre-recorded. So thank you very much for everyone for having done that work uh, beforehand, which helped us manage the time given all the parallel sessions going on at the same time. Um, we have presentations by Renard Sexton, who are, uh, unfortunately will not be able to join us today. Uh, the, this session is clashing with a lot of teaching and Labor Day in the US and a series of other issues. So Renard has sent us his pre-recorded um, uh, presentation. Uh, then we have Colette Salemi presenting joint work with uh, Jeff Bloom and uh, Ada Gonzalez Torres, who's presenting joint work with Elena Esposito, who will try to also join us a bit later. Um, so uh, we will start, and I'll introduce the speakers uh, uh, as as uh, one at a time. So the, the way we sort of thought about running these, we'll have the three presentations, uh, one after the other, and then we'll leave time at the end for Q&A. Um, and uh, may I ask everyone, if during the presentations or afterwards you have any questions, could you please add them to the Q&A tab and not to the chat tab because it's slightly easier to manage because the, the, the chat has a lot going on there as well. So if you add to the Q&A, I will be monitoring them and, uh, and we'll be asking the questions on your behalf. If by some chance we have a bit more time at the end, I may unmute a few people, but let's see how it goes. Uh, so far in the morning, that did not happen uh, because of lack of time, but we'll try. Uh, okay, so um, Eva will be kindly uploading the presentations, and the first one is by Renard Sexton. Uh, Renard is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Emory University. He, is, uh, uh, he works on the relationship between conflict and development. And he's going to, uh, uh, the presentation that we're going to upload from him uh, is looking at how government capacity um, improves subs uh, the ability of um, governments to uh, improve uh, pandemic risk reporting in conflict areas. Uh, so if, if you don't mind loading up the presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thanks for giving me the chance to present this paper to you all. I'm sorry that I can't be here live. Um, so you'll just have to settle for the recorded version. So today I'm going to be talking to you about our paper, Sustained Government Engagement Improves Subsequent Pandemic Risk Reporting in Conflict Zones. This paper was recently published uh, in the APSR. And so we'll be talking about some of our results uh, and how we carried out this study. It's a joint project with Dotan Haim from Florida State and Nico Ravanilia from uh, UC San Diego. And uh, we have a link here to see the published version of the paper. So um, going back to 2004, there was the massive Indian Ocean tsunami. And this, di this disaster was really transformative in this, in this region, uh, big impacts throughout Southeast Asia. And when we look at two different areas that were both impacted by the 2004 tsunami um, that were at that time experiencing conflict, what's interesting is that the disaster pushed in two very different directions. So in the context of Aceh, um, the ongoing violence between um, Acehese insurgents and the Indonesian state, um, the tsunami experience and the uh, buildup afterwards or the reconstruction process afterwards is widely considered to have pushed towards peaceful resolution of that conflict and you know transformation of that conflict towards peace. In the in the in contrast, in Sri Lanka, the ongoing uh, fight between the Tamil Tigers and the Sri Lankan state, the conflict or the, the disaster, the tsunami disaster, is regarded to have pushed 
the conflict even more uh, deeply into conflict. So what we found is that these crises responded to a disaster in two very different directions. So uh, the conflict could uh, become worse or, or become better as a result of the, of the um, disaster response. And when we think about disasters, you know, these, what we think of as quote unquote natural disasters, you know, hundreds of millions of people are affected uh, every year. And many of the deaths that occur as a result of natural disasters occur in conflict affected areas. And so, you know, a couple of the things that we're trying to understand here is there is this issue in conflict zones where governments really struggle to communicate with insurgent groups, communities in these conflicted conflict affected areas are often skeptical of the government. And so there's a real lack of information flow and, and, and slow responses uh, to these disasters. So what we wanted to find out is how can governments improve community participation in the wake of these large crisis uh, situations? And our thought is that the lack of cooperation with government sponsored crisis response is, is a symptom of larger issues of trust. And as a result, citizens and especially local leaders are just not very incentivized or not very willing to share information to governments, even when crises take place because of the lack of legitimacy. But the literature to date suggests that by delivering economic services and improving things, um, you know, governments can uh, make local communities trust them more. And so there's this kind of counterinsurgency literature that suggests that this is possible. Now, the question is, would this actually hold for emergency scenarios, crisis scenarios? It's possible that a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic could totally swamp out and, and overwhelm um, any confidence building effort, efforts. Um, on the other hand, it could be that it generates a sort of rally around the flag effect that makes people all want to cooperate. So the, the context that we're going to look at for this is the conflict affected region of Bicol region in the Philippines, where there's been a communist insurgency ongoing since the 1960s. And this uh, zone, this, this map here shows where Bicol region fits within the, the Philippines. And um, over the last five or 10 years, um, which percentage of local villages have had a uh, strong NPA presence. So you can see that there's been quite a, quite a bit in, in these zones, especially in the farther flung regions. Now, uh, we were carrying out an RCT trying to build relationships between government services and these um, conflict affected uh, countries when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And so what we wanted to understand is as this crisis strikes the Philippines in March, uh, lo lockdown is announced by the president's office. Um, we want to understand whether the, the in intervention that we were carrying out called USAP Dayo, which was increasing service provision in these conflict affected areas, would it actually build trust and help to respond to this crisis more effectively? Um, and you know, even today, frankly, information sharing is, is, is really important, but in the early days, sharing information was in really, really valuable as government tried to determine how to respond to this pandemic crisis. So the, the program that we were implementing, USAP Tayo, was a combination of the uh, Philippine National Police, the Region 5 uh, from Bicol Region, uh, Regional Headquarters, uh, the, the Philippines Department of Social Welfare and Development, and other civilian agencies that provide services to local communities. The idea was on a monthly basis, these agencies would convene with local village uh, leaders in these conflict affected areas to try and figure out what's to try and match villages with services that these government agencies could provide. And the idea was to build on some of the best practices that have been learned from the literature about what appears to work uh, when it comes to these kind of community oriented service delivery efforts in conflict affected areas. So they, they were supposed to be small, they're supposed to be feasible, they're supposed to have repeated interactions, and it's supposed to be locally rather than top down um, driven. And just to give you an example of some of the things that these uh, villages were able to receive through the USAP Dayar program, they were all new services for these villages, but they're programs that pre-existed. So these were long-standing government efforts that were just not making their way to these conflict-affected areas. And some examples are getting job training, getting licensed for jobs, uh, getting seedlings from uh, the Department of Agriculture, 
getting um, assistance in you know, starting your own small businesses or graduating from high school. Um, a really successful one was a security guard program in which um, you know, high school graduates from far-flung conflict-affected barangays were able to get licensed to become security guards and then go essentially be mall security in some of the more urban areas, which was a very, a really good job. It's, it's well paid and you can send money back home. So we did one full year of testing uh, starting in 2018 before we even rolled out the program in 2019. So to give you a sense of, of the region, as I showed you, we're, we're, we um, did randomization both at the municipality level and then at the village level. So within all of Bicol region, um, we excluded municipalities that were very, very remote or were too um, affected by conflict to be included, which only excluded a you know, relatively small number. And we ended up with a total of 80 municipalities. We then randomized half of those municipalities to receive Usap Tayo. And those ones are in dark blue here. And then the other 40 to be in the control. Then within each of these municipalities, we randomized five villages to receive Usap Tayo and five to be in our control group just to zoom in so you can see. So within all of these treated municipalities, you see that there are five in red and five in white, uh, and that those show you um, the treatment and control villages. So altogether, we had 200 treated villages and 600 um, control villages. We carried out a baseline survey back in 2019. Um, we got information from all the village capitans and also uh, the, the youth chairs. Um, we included various endorsement experiments to understand people's attitudes towards conflict, uh, even though those are very sensitive. So we don't want to ask them directly. So instead we use endorsement experiments to gather that information. Now in 2020, after about six months of operating, the USAP Tayo program was halted because of the quarantine order, because of um, the pandemic. Now the interagency region five task force on COVID, uh, which had the PNP, DSWD, all of our partner agencies, quickly had to figure out a triage plan for how they were going to respond to the lock lockdown order and figure out how to allocate you know, limited testing resources and other public health resources. Now, in these conflict-affected areas, they really had a difficult time uh, being able to reach the population. So um, they sent out a community health survey via, via text message to the leaders of all the, the communities in the conflict-affected regions. And these are the three questions that they were asking. Basically, did they have high-risk individuals? Had people visited Metro Manila recently? That's where all the transmission of, of infection was taking place. And finally, are there anybody, people with symptoms? And as of March, 2020, this, these were the best information or the best questions that the public health authorities could ask at the time based on what they knew. And uh, the PMP, our partner, collected this information on behalf of the task force in the conflict-affected areas. And so what we wanted to know, we asked the PNP, uh, could, could they share ag aggregate data, which they're happy to do. We wanted to know whether capitans from these uh, conflict affected areas actually responded to this request for information, which was so critical for them you know, taking decisions. And we found that overall about 53% of village leaders responded to this request from the task force to share those, those three pieces of information about COVID risk. What was interesting though, is that in our treated areas, those places that were receiving services and participating in USAP Tayo, 61% of village leaders responded, whereas in control areas, only 51%. And this is to summarize the effect. So we see at the village level about a 10 percentage point increase or about 20% uh, treatment effect from our, from our um, intervention, the USAP Tayo intervention, which had been going on for about six months. Um, this chart here summarizes that uh, the first and second um, coefficients use the village level randomization. The third one here uses the municipality level randomization. And you can see the effects are quite consistent, which is, which is good to see. Also, we did a check of spillovers by comparing control barangays, control villages in the control areas versus control barangays in the treated areas. Now we would expect there to be no difference between them if there are no spillovers. So we're happy here to see that in fact, there weren't any spillovers. So um, this helps us to feel confident that our randomization actually worked and there was not interference between our units. So to understand what was driving these effects, which are really quite important that Uzaptayo seems to have incentivized these uh, village leaders in conflict affected areas to participate and collaborate with the government in dealing with this crisis, which kinds of people did this matter the most for? And we looked at four different characteristics at baseline. 
the support for the uh, support for the rebels, how much they trusted the government, whether the government has capacity, and lastly, whether you need political connections to access services. So first, using an endorsement experiment at the municipal level, we looked at municip municipalities that were positively disposed towards the rebels versus those that were negatively or neutrally disposed towards the rebels. And we found is that the biggest treatment effect, that is where Usopp Tayo pushed people the most to, to, to share with the government relative to control was in these places that at baseline were quite positively disposed towards the rebels. Similarly, or sort of uh, additionally, uh, we found that it was places that had medium levels of trust in the government. It wasn't that they totally trusted the government or totally didn't trust the government. Instead, the effects were primarily in these zones, which had uh, middle range trust in the government, where the effects were the strongest. We also found that the effect was driven primarily by barangays, where at baseline, the village leaders did not believe that the government has the capacity to meet their needs. The places that already believe that the government has capacity, there was no treatment effect. And lastly, we found a small difference uh, in that places that believe that you, you needed to be connected to get services, rather those that didn't believe that you needed connections, we found the treatment effect was a bit stronger. So we have evidence from these regressions and also some um, additional stuff from the paper that really it was updating of beliefs by these uh, conflict affected villages, the leaders of those conflict affected villages, um, regarding the capacity of the government to meet their needs. Uh, in earlier years, the NPA, you know, the rebels really emphasized to villages that the government can't help you. They can't meet your needs. Don't, don't rely on them, rely on us instead. So people had a relatively low baseline belief that the government could, could deliver for them. And it's actually in those places where people change their behavior the most to cooperate on the, on the um, COVID information collection um, as a result of who's up dial. We also rule out a, a bunch of other mechanisms in the paper. So it's not because of a change in security. It's not because of capture of the program by the rebels. We also have some evidence that, uh, you know, the overall evidence here is that investing in this soft uh, public services, these relatively small programs really can help uh, when crises uh, uh, occur. And it's really important to note that this program seems to have worked by convincing those people that were most skeptical at baseline. And, um, you know, certainly as of when this paper was published at the beginning of 2021, relatively little experimental work had been done when it comes to social science on how COVID-19 mitigation can work, especially in the developing world and especially in um, conflict affected areas. So with that, I'll close and say thanks so much for listening to this. Um, as I mentioned, the paper um, has been published, but the experiment is ongoing. So feedback is really, really welcome. We're hoping to actually um, collect, we, we've continued running Usap Tayo as a remote uh, uh, program. That's had a lot of challenges, especially because these conflict affected areas don't have great cell phone um, access uh, in some cases. Um, and so it's been tricky to do that, but we're, we're still gonna be collecting data for the next year or so. So any feedback would be really welcome. We also think that there's some relevant po policy implications. So um, any and all comments are, are welcome. So thanks very much. Um, I appreciate your time and um, it's great to be here. Okay, perfect. And like I mentioned before, any uh, questions, please add them to the Q&A. And if they are directed to Renard, please do feel free to still add them on uh, and I will pass it on to him because as you heard, he would really appreciate that. So um, now we move to Colette uh, Salemi, who's presenting a paper with Jeff Bloom. Uh, Colette is a microeconomist and she's a PhD uh, candidate at the University of Minnesota. She's working on the nexus between conflict migration and natural resources in developing countries. And uh, Colette uh, and Jeff have a paper, um, well, it's actually an update of an earlier paper on the effects of COVID on uh, Syria of uh, conflict patterns. Um, so Avery, if you don't mind loading up the, this presentation too. Hello, my name is Jeff Bloom and I am a research economist at the USDA's Economic Research Service. And my name is Colette Salemi. I'm a PhD student in applied economics at the University of Minnesota. In this presentation, we will be sharing an update on our descriptive work on conflict events and the COVID-19 pandemic. The relationship between the COVID-19 pandemic and conflict is theoretically ambiguous. On the one hand, the pandemic has reduced local incomes and in turn, the opportunity cost of engaging in violence. This could increase conflict, 
On the other hand, the pandemic has reduced the value of some natural and physical resources. This could reduce conflict. In addition, disruptions to food supply chains, especially at the onset of the pandemic, could lead to higher levels of conflict. In this presentation, we will be updating our descriptive analysis from our paper, COVID-19 and Conflict, published earlier this year in World Development. We specifically document time series trends in different types of intergroup conflict, and we discuss five quantitative case studies in India, Syria, Libya, Lebanon, and Chile. We use data from the Armed Conflict Event and Location Data Project from July 2019 to, in this update, July 2021. We analyze daily counts of violent events including battles, bombings, explosions, remote violence, and violence against civilians, as well as demonstration events, including protests and riots. After an initial dip in conflict events in the days immediately following the World Health Organization's declaration of COVID-19 as a pandemic, daily counts of conflict have, have at least entirely rebounded. In fact, in 2021, the daily counts of conflict may be higher than they were prior to the pandemic. While violent events do seem to be declining, it is hard to attribute this decline to COVID-19 as the trends appear to predate the onset of the pandemic. Here we show the trends over time for battles, remote violence and bombings, and violence against civilians. This initial dip in conflict events is even more dramatic when we look specifically at trends in protests. After a very steep but brief dip in mid-2020, protest events bounced back and almost doubled their pre-pandemic daily count. This is consistent with the idea that the initial national lockdown slowed protest events, but frustrations with political leadership may have increased since the initial months of the pandemic. We do not see any noticeable trend in riots, which are much more scarce of an event in ACLED data. In the initial months of the pandemic, India implemented one of the world's most strictly enforced national lockdowns. This lockdown stranded millions of migrant workers in urban areas with little access to food or social support. We see a short-term reduction in all types of conflict events, and this corresponds to a short-term fall in protests. There is also a sharp spike in violence against civilians and riots corresponding to the lockdown. Conflict trends in India have mostly rebounded to pre-pandemic levels by July 2021. Syria is within a decade-long civil war. In March 2020, Turkey and Russia negotiated a ceasefire agreement over the Idlib governorate of Syria. The ceasefire was unrelated to the COVID-19 pandemic. It appears that the ceasefire led to a sharp reduction in all violent events. Through the summer of 2021, conflict has remained at relatively lower levels than in past years. But bombings have continued in the Idlib governorate in 2021, with numerous actors violating the terms of the still active ceasefire agreement. In Libya, the pandemic overlapped with the war between the Government of National Accord, or the GNA, and the Libyan National Army, the LNA. In April 2020, the LNA called for a pandemic-motivated ceasefire, but the GNA refused. In late April 2020, Libya imposed a 24-hour lockdown and then 10 days of curfews. After a small dip in conflict in early 2020, we see a steep rise through March 2020. This increase persists through the WHO's declaration of COVID-19 as a pandemic. Conflict peaked and eventually declined as GNA victory sent the LNA into retreat. In October 2020, the two factions signed a permanent ceasefire and violence has remained low ever since. In late 2019, protests motivated by government corruption and a deep financial crisis erupted throughout Lebanon. The country implemented a national lockdown on March 15, 2020. The lockdown does not seem to have led to a reduction in demonstrations. Daily counts were already falling in the preceding months. Despite the lockdown, there was an increase in demonstrations in March through June 2020. Protests and riots spiked again in the spring of 2021 as the Lebanese pound's value hit historic lows. In 
Recent protests also took place around the anniversary of the 2020 Beirut port explosion. In 2019, Chile experienced a dramatic escalation of civil protests, ultimately motivated by increasing economic inequality and political representation. Daily counts of these demonstrations were declining in early 2020, but began intensifying in March 2020. On March 13, the Chilean government banned public gatherings of more than 500 people. This led to a sharp decline in both riots and protests after the national ban, which have yet to return to pre-pandemic levels. Across all accolade countries, we see a short-term decline in intergroup conflict in the initial months of the COVID-19 pandemic. This trend is more due to a U-shaped trend in protests than any other systematic trend in violent conflict. We also document critical heterogeneity across types of conflict and countries. This heterogeneity is important, but makes causal inference tricky. How do we deal with confounding events? What is an appropriate control group? In many contexts, we need more data on income and COVID-19 prevalence, but some progress has been made. Berman et al. in a 2021 article find similar results to our descriptive trends, but use a much more sophisticated estimation approach to deal with the challenges of endogeneity in the relationship between COVID-19 and conflict worldwide. Thank you so much for attending our talk. We look forward to your questions and comments during the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Colette. Um, uh, again, uh, any questions, please add them to the Q&A. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing this paper being presented last year, and it's it's really good to see the update. I mean, this is really valuable work. Um, and But now we're going to go back in time a little bit, and we have um, Ada Gonzalez Torres, who is going to talk about a previous virus outbreak and the impact on violent conflict. Uh, she's talking about the Ebola virus in, uh, uh, in West Africa. Ada is an assistant professor in the economics department at the Ben Gurion University of Negev in Israel, and her research focuses on the social aspects of epidemic outbreaks and the causes and consequences of violent conflict. So um, absolutely ideal for the panel that we um, uh, put together here. Uh, Ada also has a pre-recorded um, presentation and is with us here in the panel and available for questions afterwards. Thank you very much. And Eva, if you don't mind again. I'm presenting a paper on epidemics and conflict uh, based on evidence from the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa. This is co-authored with Elena Esposito at the University of Lausanne. We study whether epidemics lead to conflict, taking the case of the 2014-15 Ebola outbreak. Um, in particular, we study civil violence, riots, protests, and violence against civilians. We also study what drives uh, this effect related to trust, and the provision of public goods. We also provide evidence of long run impacts on violence. The West African Ebola outbreak in a nutshell. The 2014-15 Ebola epidemic is the largest in the history of the disease, caused around 30,000 infections and over 11,000 deaths. It hit Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone for the first time. You can see here the timeline, it's one epidemic. It's hits for the first time in early 2014 and ends around 2015 uh, with a few cases still recorded in 2016. The case fatality rate is of 40% and the media, median age of death is around 30. Uh, the overall epidemic burden is 500 deaths per uh, million in the population. And this is led by Lib Liberia with 11 100 deaths uh, per million people. Uh, this burden is similar in magnitude to the countries that were most hit uh, by COVID, uh, but it's orders of magnitude higher compared to um, the COVID burden in Africa so far for a similar time period. We focus on Ebola infections. Uh, this is the relevant measure uh, because Ebola is very rarely asymptomatic. It's a brutal disease. People may die within one to two weeks since symptom onset. And uh, Ebola survivors on average have moderate to severe long-run consequences, including loss of sight, premature death, and other consequences. 
you can only transmit Ebola if you already have symptoms and it's transmitted only through body fluids. So it's not airborne. Here's a snapshot of the data. Uh, Ebola hit for the first time Guinea at the intersection of Sierra Leone and Liberia. Um, you can see in June 2014, it was already spreading and there are a few civil violence events. One month after Ebola spreads more and we see more civil violence events, especially in places uh, with Ebola cases. Now, whether this is causal or not, this is the main question of this paper. So in general, if you want to study the impact of an epidemic on civil violence, uh, the main identification issue is that violence could exacerbate the spread of disease and weak institutions or poverty can facilitate the spread of both. Uh, we address this uh, using an empirical strategy that is a difference in difference design combined with an instrumental variable strategy. So we're going to look at the incidence of conflict in places that later on are going to be more or less hit by Ebola pre and post epidemic. The identification lies on the fact that the timing of the first uh, Ebola case is random. It's the contagion between a bat and a human being and all other cases are human to human contagions, largely driven by the geographic distance to the first case. And in a parallel trans assumption uh, that we're going to test empirically. We also propose an IV for the overall epidemic burden uh, to address this possibility that there's post-treatment selection into high Ebola areas being driven by social unrest or other time varying confounders. The IV is the geographic distance to the first case interacted by a post-treatment dummy. It has the advantage that, well, it predicts uh, Ebola, uh, but also uh, we can test whether it predicts conflict before Ebola starts and it does not. Um, and uh, it's, it is a, geome a geometric distance to the first Ebola case, as opposed to uh, actual travel routes or uh, transport systems, which may be related to conflict or variables related to conflict. The estimating equation uh, is a difference in differences and continuous treatment where Ebola total is either the number of Ebola cases measured at the end or at yearly quarters. Uh, and conflict is conflict in the early quarters. And this is a post treatment dummy. I'm going to show you results for a flexible difference in differences uh, design uh, where instead of the post treatment dummy, we have a time dummy for each yearly quarter before and after the epidemic hits. And this will allow us to look graphically at the parallel trans assumption. Here you have the main results. Uh, so you see the, here the coefficient for each quarter time dummy before and after the epidemic hits. You can see that there's no difference in conflict incidents in places uh, that later on are going to be more or less hit by Ebola before the epidemic starts. Once the epidemic hits, we see a significant rise in civil violence driven by places with high incidence of Ebola. And this is, uh, starting especially in the second half of 2014, which is when Sierra Leone and Liberia get hit, which are driving the results. The regression results suggest that a one standard deviation increase in Ebola incidence leads to an increase by eight to 16% standard deviation in conflict during the Ebola epidemic. Back of the envelope calculation suggests that the overall increase in conflict due to the epidemic is about 40% in conflict incidents from a baseline of 100 uh, civil violent events in a year. Here you have the regression results. Um, you see the OLS coefficient, the less coefficient, which was written down in the last slide. You can also see the reduced form effect of the distance to the epicenter and the fact that we have a strong uh, first stage and no pretrends. The the impact of the epidemic on civil violence is uh, robust to different specifications and tests. Here I only lay out a few and I want to uh, draw your attention to the first. So we also run a high frequency panel with fixed effects at bi-weekly level. And this addresses the concern that newspaper reporters move into high Ebola areas in order to report conflict. 
very, very unlikely they can do this in two weeks. And also they don't know with that accuracy, the number of Ebola cases uh, live. So once we've established that the epidemic led to civil violence, we want to know why this is the case and when we expect this to be the case. A standard model of conflict would predict an ambiguous effect of the epidemic on civil violence, because there are some aspects of the epidemic that lower the opportunity cost of rioting, for instance, the negative income shock. And there are other aspects that actually uh, lower the benefits of engaging in, in violence, as for instance, the fact that uh, you have increased uh, risk of contagion. So uh, in theory, we expect an ambiguous effect. However, we, we suggest in this paper uh, that there, there is something that we, we, we do know uh, that an epidemic uh, will change uh, systematically. And that is the demands for the state. In particular, an epidemic increases the demand for a state to halt contagion. And the state can do this in many ways. It can provide hospitals to treat patients, can uh, enforce quarantines to avoid new contagions, um, or vaccines with the same purpose. Whether what the state does is perceived as good or bad will depend on trust in institutions and on what the state eventually does or does not do. So hospitals, for instance, may be uh, good or neutral, uh, independently of trust in institutions, versus the other measures may be more dependent on how much you trust uh, your state. To study this, uh, we're going to look at heterogeneous effects of the epidemic on conflict by pre-existing levels of trust. And we're going to run a, an event study design based on the provision of uh, public goods. So for the first, uh, just looking at the impact of uh, the Ebola epidemic on conflict incidents in places with below versus above uh, mean level of trust, what we see is that the effect is entirely driven by places with low trust. And there is no impact of the epidemic on conflict in places with high trust. In terms of the policies, we see that uh, Ebola treatment units, which are hospitals, uh, they, uh, they, we observe a, a, a lowering uh, of conflict in places that, uh, that get the Ebola treatment units after they arrive. And we see a rise in conflict in places that get area of locates or district quarantines in places uh, where they arise. When we split this in low and high trust areas, what we find is that um, the establishment of Ebola treatment units or hospitals to treat patients lowers trust both in both areas. Uh, more significant, but the, the effect is significant in places with low trust. This is consistent with the model in which in high trust areas, there's only one equilibrium of no conflict versus in low trust areas, uh, there are two potential equilibria uh, with conflict and without conflict. Uh, when, you, uh, when the epidemic hits and the state reacts by establishing hospitals, uh, you're more likely to, to go to the uh, low conflict equilibrium. Uh, for district quarantines, we have divergent effects in high trust areas and low trust areas. In places with high trust, uh, people trust the state that these coercive measures are helping in halting the epidemic. There is, if anything, there's a lowering of conflict. In low trust areas, on the contrary, uh, these measures are interpreted as coercive and you see a rise in civil violence in these places. Finally, uh, we also look at long run impacts uh, on conflict and we find that the, the places that are going to be more hit by Ebola in those 2014-15 uh, uh, outbreak, um, see no difference in conflict in the years prior to the pandemic outbreak. And they, however, they see a rise in conflict both during the outbreak and years after the outbreak ended, suggesting that there are long run effects of the, this epidemic conflict relationship. To conclude, um, this paper suggests that epidemics may act as a critical juncture. When they arrive, there's a raise in demand uh, for public goods uh, and for a response from the state. Now, depending on what the state does and depending on underlying levels of trust, 
This leads to multiple equilibria, possibly leading to civil violence. And this has long run consequences for affected areas. Policy implications of these findings is that building trust is crucial to halt an epidemic and break cycles of civil violence. Thank you very much, um, Ada, and also uh, to your co-author. Um, so uh, we have a few questions in the Q&A, but before, uh, let me just uh, give some some of my taking. So I, I, this, these are three really important papers, and they're some, of, they're some of my favorite papers in this very small area of research, but growing, and I presume it will keep growing, uh, sadly. Um, and it, I think there are two main takeaways. I mean, the, the papers clearly show that something that is fundamentally a public health adverse shock has political implications. And given um, everything that has been shown uh, across all these different uh, case studies, it, does, it, it doesn't bode well because we would, can only assume that some of these trends will carry on as the pandemic develops. Um, the other uh, important takeaway, I think, that's shown in all the, the papers is this idea that uh, crisis responses are very, very important because they uh, crises are interlinked. So something that has happened uh, in the past will have uh, implications for uh, future uh, ways of dealing with pandemics. And uh, this kind of brings home uh, this kind of cycle of government intervention and so forth. And in particular, what seems to be shown both in the first paper and the third paper is that uh, trust uh, and social and political trust are the driving factors whereby one shock is has implications for a second shock happening much later. Um, so these are very, very important results and, uh, uh, and, uh, and really, uh, I think, should um, raise a number of questions. But um, I have a few, but let me first go to the Q&A and, uh, and ask the questions that are there. Um, there seems to be two questions for Colette. Uh, Colette, um, uh, th this is by uh, Alwesha. And uh, the question asks, uh, the conflicts seem to be very different in nature, varying from demonstrations to violent conflict. Have you analyzed the data from two separate types of conflict separately? And that is an, a related question, uh, which touches upon the issue. Uh, many demonstrations were actually anti-lockdown. Have you been able to separate these demonstrations from other political demonstrations with uh, show ongoing serious problems in these various countries? So the underlying social tensions that might have been there even without the pandemic, I assume. Yes, yeah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful questions. Um, the first one I might need a uh, a bit of clarification because we did try to disentangle and i think you know our our presentation tried to convey the cases in which we were looking explicitly at protests which often in our data means protests that were predominantly peaceful um rioting or versus riots which are often coded as less less peaceful pro protesting and destruction of property so we're trying to as well as on the other hand different types of violent events so we disaggregated as much as we could with the data that we have from ACLED. Um, the challenge with disaggregating further to your point about the type of protest is often that information isn't complete within our data. So I think you're totally right. It would be very interesting to just separately look at just trends in the anti-lockdown protests. When did they happen? I think we may have lost Colette, or it's just me. Okay, uh, let's uh, maybe Eva, you could contact Colette and see if we can solve the technical problems. In the meantime, we'll, uh, uh, let me move to Ada. Ada, I actually had a question about uh, your paper. Uh, obviously, looking at Ebola, uh, very important results. Um, what do you think are the lessons for the current COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, and, uh, so Colette, right. you're back again. We're just moving to yes. Ada and then I'll give you the chance to go back. <laughs> Is that okay? I don't, yes, I don't know what's happening. I never lost your audio, but I know I disappeared. So please continue. <laughs> you vanished. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me ask Ada the question then and then we come back to you. So Ada, I was asking, um, uh, what do you think are the lessons for COVID-19? Um, and uh, and whether your findings may provide some explanations for the patterns that uh, Colette and Jeff are talking about in their paper. And then after that, we'll go back to Colette. Maybe she wants to add. 
Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I'm also actually curious to, to hear what else Colette thinks about this. Um, but so we, we do think that this can be applied to other pandemics. I did try to uh, convey uh, like also the differences in the, between like the two types of disease. Uh, so uh, uh, Ebola like struck much more quickly and it uh, hits mostly younger uh, populations. Um, especially like the most, uh, in, uh, in terms of deaths and so on, obviously COVID hits uh, all, like all ages, but um, like the, these could be differences that, that may matter. Uh, the fatality rate uh, was really high. Um, but, but, but on the other hand also, I think that the main, uh, the, maybe the, like the main policy finding is is really this difference between a low and high trust areas, which which can be applied also in this in the case of uh, of, of COVID, in the sense that um, we we expect mostly uh, events of civil violence, mostly in places with low trust, and really building uh, uh, building trust with. Uh, between the state and, and civilians is, is key also uh, not only to to avoid the spread of violence but also to ensure the the adoption of certain measures that can be perceived as coercive so uh, or or that may be um, maybe misunderstood uh. Sorry, I was muted. That's great. Uh, Colette, do you want to go back to your answer? And also, maybe you have some thoughts about uh, what Adi just mentioned? Um, sure. So, yeah, and, and apologies again for the internet issues. Um, I completely agree that there is a case to be made for doing a separate analysis just looking at anti-lockdown protests and looking at protests that are explicitly in response to grievances around governance at this time because that is anecdotally what we what we've been reading a lot about um uh the, it, it's mostly a challenge of of um of actually coding that in the conflict event data that's that's really where the challenge lies but i i completely agree it's something that's super interesting it just was uh, a little bit too much work for this current project um Great. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's understandable. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't see any more questions. I don't know if anyone has anything to add. We actually over time, uh, but I am told it's not a big issue. No. Okay. So let me uh, bring this uh, panel to an end and thank you uh, both for joining us and thank you for the participants uh, for joining us as well. If anyone is interested in more uh, conflict related issues, we'll have a coffee break at uh, 6.30 p.m. Helsinki time. I will not attempt to move that into to tell you what that is in other time zones. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have on Wednesday at 17.50, uh, so 5.50 p.m. Helsinki time, we have an interview with Chris Blackman uh, as well for those interested in conflict. Uh, so I hope to see you either later or on Wednesday. Uh, take care and thanks very much, Colette and Ada, for joining us. Thank you so much for uh, yes, the opportunity to present. Nice to meet you all. Nice to see you too.